שלום עליכם. שבוע טוב. I see there's funny images on my uh, screen, lifting weights with uh, all kinds of funny things. This must be a Purim trick my uh, computer's doing to me. <laughs> Let's try to erase this. Oh, that looks a little better. That looks more like me. Anyways, I guess that's Purim. You know, the Chodesh, Adar itself is the Chodesh of the, of the mask, of the costume, of uh, revealing our costume by looking at the mask. Okay, and this uh, morning we're going to go back to Mesechet Brachot, Perak Haro'e, the Perak about dreams and dream interpretation. And every class that we do on this, there are many, many subtle ideas that can't give over all at once. But I trust all of you to use this information as a way of comparing your mental experience to that of the Torah, because there's a connection. This is why we learn the Torah, because we believe the Torah is not just a document of information. It is a document of our reality. Okay. So we are on Daf Nun Vav Amud Bet, and it starts out, Aroi Chamor Bahalom, someone who sees a donkey in his dream. <laughs> what do you think about that? Uh, not too much, usually. Well, the Gemara says, no, Yitzapel L'Shu'a, you should look forward to salvation. That's a good thing. Right, he brings the famous pasuk that tells us that everybody knows the Messiah is arriving on a donkey, you know, and not a, uh, a Hummer limousine. Well, we're not sure, but the donkey is not a symbol of a car. It's a symbol of time. It's a symbol of the trans movement of time that a donkey moves slowly but steadily a horse moves fast but it's not so steady so the idea of the don the messiah coming on a donkey is the idea of slowing down the process that it, it, it's a slow process if you've ever ridden a donkey it's not so comfortable <laughs> And he's over a rocky road. But the donkey, he symbolizes going slow but steady and strong. And that's what we need to endure the whole Havilah de Mashiach, all the, the sufferings of the Messianic era. So let's not speed things up too much because the sign of the donkey is the sign of salvation. If you see a cat in your dream, what does that mean, to see a cat in your dream? In a place where they call the cat the shunra, which is an Aramaic word for cat. In other words, if you live in a place where that's your everyday language, you understand? That the everyday language of a person is mashpia, is influencing his dreams. So because if, if you call cat cat in Seattle... Uh, then it's not going to have the same impact on your mind as if you live in Babylon and you call it a shunra. No, but if you see a shunra in a place where they speak Aramaic, naset lo shira na'a, they're going to make for him a nice song, a beautiful song. Okay, that's kind of interesting what that means. I mean, does it mean someone else writes a song about me? Or does that someone else <laughs> writes a song? Uh, is the cat is the cat too uh, close to my personal life? Or does it really represent a song, etc.? These are questions that every person has to answer. Because if you think... Uh, excuse me, folks. We just... Okay, we're back, folks, and uh, we are back <laughs> from the <laughs> from the technical difficulties of this situation. But we're going to overcome that. 
The cat is a symbol in the dream of a person who speaks Aramaic, a shunra, it's a good thing. It says that Naset Lo Shira Na, beautiful song. Shinra, but if he changes the voweling just a little bit, right, from a shunra to a shinra, Naselo Shinui Ra. It means that an evil change is coming upon the person. So you see, one vowel in the language will cause one vowel in the language will cause the whole interpretation to change. So how is that? Our whole lives and our future depends on the change of a vowel? It seems a bit uh, a bit much for most people. But remember what we've been learning all along in this parak. That the language of our thinking and our speech interacts with the language of our dreams. That there are these two simultaneous experiences of communication. One is between us and our friends here in the Chabura of Nar Shalom and the, and one is between you and the upper world in your dreams. They're different languages, but they're using similar symbols called the Hebrew letters. And because the Hebrew letters are divine, they're flexible. And that's a very important thing. If you want to be divine, you got to be flexible. If you're rigid, uh, oy vavoy. <laughs> we've all dealt with our own rigidness. But rigid means I, I have a difficulty changing and receiving, receiving advice, receiving information. And it might be information from my boss or my wife or my dreams. But I still have to have this flexibility of interpretation. This rigidness is too much. You see this table shaking. It's a it's an earthquake. <laughs> Anyways, Shavuot Tov, everybody. I hope you're having a good time. We've had three days of the what I call the, the storm of the year in Israel. It just hasn't stopped. And that's good. Keeps us home and, uh, you know, where the bears are, hibernating with the Torah. I mean, that's what we're supposed to do in the winter. And so... If you see a shunra, it's a sign of a, they're going to make a song about you, which means it's something good's happened. And if it's a shinra, it means it's a shinui, because the lashon shini, shinui is a shinra. The same thing, you split the word and you come up with a new interpretation. That's part of the beauty and the miracle of Hebrew, that there is this multiple flexibility of interpretation. And we need that flexibility of mind to receive that flexibility of interpretation. Now, if you see grapes in your dream, now, live on note. Now, if they're white grapes, here we go, getting specific. If they're white grapes, then whether they're ripe or not, it's a good sign to see white grapes in your dream. You know, I guess if you're a vintner in southern France, it'd be great. But <laughs> what does that tell me? Yafot. What does that mean? Shahorot. But if the grapes are black, bismanam yafot. If it's the time for the ripening and they're dark grapes, that's fine. Shalob bismanam. But if they're early grapes, raot. Then, then again, it's a negative sign. But it doesn't tell us what. It could be a it could be a, a a sign about my crops, about my grapes, if you own vineyards. But it can also, of course, be connected to the idea of looking forward to good versus fearing the future. Now this seems to me one of the essential problems that human beings have in this world, uh, is that a part of me is worried about the future, and part of me is worried about the present. And neither of those parts are based on information. They're based on, they're based on supposition. Suppose. Suppose this could happen. Suppose that could happen. Mm. Suppose that could be... Suppose that that interpretation of the moment could be forever. 
We learned before that you could have a dream and it won't happen for 20 years. You want to be a prophet? Can you hold on to your prophecy for 20 years and not worry about it? That's mental strength. Real spiritual strength is being able to hold on to the idea of the unknown of the future, to, to, to the idea of the difficult accessibility of the past, and to living in the present. We have to have all of those. Because we're from, we're created by a God who is all of those. So our soul is from all of those. Here's another one interesting. Someone who sees a white horse in a dream, certainly that's uh, achieved literary symbolic status throughout the centuries of uh, literature. You see a white dream, a white horse in your dream, bain but nahat bain but raduf, yafelo. Whether it's running or not running, if it's a white horse, it's a good sign. Well, I don't, but if it's red, if it's a red horse, okay. If it's benachat, if the red horse is munching grass on the side of the road, that's fine. But raduf, but if the red horse is chasing, chasing whatever, it doesn't say what, but chasing, then it's kashe. So here we have the, the distinction in Kabbalah that we've had many times between red and white. Red is always a symbol of gvora, of power, of might. And white is always a, a symbol of purity, of innocence, of, of something good. So you see, even if the, ho- the color of the horse in the dream is impacting it. Now, of course, again, we, we have whatever you see in your dream, you could just go to three of your fellow Jews and tell them, I need you to poterly this dream. I need you to, to, absolve this dream that's that's automatically an out for anybody who has a difficult dream you know a young woman was at our shabbos table and she gave me a dream about wild animals chasing her and surrounding her and threatening her they never touched her they never hurt her but they were all around her and i listened and i listened and you know i know this woman a little bit and she's not married. And we know that the part of the idea of Kedushin, that a man marries a woman, is that he is supposed to he is supposed to surround her with protection, and she's supposed to surround him with spiritual protection. I, I should have said physical, that a man's job is to protect a woman physically. It's certainly back in the day in the ancient world. But a woman's job is to protect a man spiritually. So there's this dual relationship between, of, of, of security and protection that's taking place in every male-female relationship. And here we see it a little bit that um, if a person sees a Seuss even in his dream, if it's red, there's a problem. If it's white, it's a symbol of purity, innocence, protection. So you see that here we're learning something very important, that in our dreams, even color is important, and timing is important, and shape, the shape of things even, is important. And we'll see more of this as we go through this parak. This is a parak that we can learn our whole lives, <laughs> and it keeps coming back to you uh, as a new thing. Because who has dreams of cats and dogs and elephants, etc.? We're going to see more. But people do. And even if it's once in your life that you have a dream of an elephant, it would be fitting for you to know what that means, at least according to the Torah. And again, it's based on the holy permutations of the Hebrew letters, that the letters of the name of a thing are spiritual powers that are combining to create that thing, but they're also representing an image in our mind. God wants to communicate with us but he can't speak straight English to us because we, we can't handle it. But he'll present images, and our job is to understand those images. So let's keep going. Now, someone who sees an Ishmaelite in his dreams. Now, this today is complex because a Ishmaelite, what does that mean? It means 
somebody that follows Islam? Well, you know, the original Ishmaelites were followers of Abraham. They weren't Muslims. There was no Muslim in the time of Yishmael. And so we're going to see here that if you see Yishmael in your dream, Tefilato Nishma'at, your prayer is heard because the name Yishmael, if you split it up, it means Yishma'el, that God will hear, in this case, Hagar's prayer for her son. So the idea of having your prayer heard is obviously a good thing. That's what we want. So seeing Yishmael is good. Ba'avav, Dafka Yishmael ben Avraham. But Dafka, it's, <laughs> you have to see the Yishmael, the son of Abraham, uh, you know, our father. So how do you know how he looks? You know, I don't think we could jump to this, the, the typical image of, a, of a, a Muslim or an Arab. That's not going to work too well. And it's also, it might not even be PC anymore. Because there's billion, there's over a billion Arabs in the world, and they look different everywhere you go. It's like Christians and Jews too. Everybody looks like the place they live. By the way, that's a secret that some of you might find interesting: is that your face changes according to your climate and your food, and the philosophy of the place you live. So, if you are an American and you move to China, your children are going to start looking more Chinese just because you eat their food. And just because you think in their thought patterns. And also because of the climate that you live in. The water, the minerals, the food. It's all different according to the continent, the land that you live in. And the people and the culture. And this is part of, by the way, this is part of the secret of the success of the Jews in exile. If you call being chased around the world for 2,000 years a success story. That's, <laughs> that's we're waiting for that to hear, right, Tuvia? We're waiting for the success to happen, but we're approaching the finish line here. But the part, part of the success of the Jews is they've been able to adapt wherever they go. And this adaptability is even reflected in our face, our food, our body, our, 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 our posture, our language. And that cultural diversity is actually part of the creation of the new unity of the future. And that's, I think, what the, the good point behind all PC is that really we need to all see each other at a very high, a high level. And not as, oh, you're a Jew, oh, you're black, oh, you're Christian, oh, you're all these categories. They just destroy our love for each other. They really mean that I have reached the end of my love. If I can't see you as a human being, then I see you as a category. You're a Jew, you're an Arab, you're a Christian, you're white, you're black, you're green, you're yellow. That means I don't love you, or I'm not loving you at that moment, because I'm categorizing you. So that's a, that's a heavy thing, and uh, we have to learn this. It takes time, but that's why we're here, because we want the truth, and we want to live the truth. Now, if you see Avraham, the son of Avraham called Yishmael in a dream, it's a very good thing. But if you see a simple Arab merchant going along in your dream, and you don't know that it's Yishmael ben Avraham, then the dream has no significance. Now, wait a minute. We just asked the question. How do I know? <laughs> I see an Arab. He's got a cloak on. He's on a camel, a donkey. He's walking with his sandals and his cane. He's got 25 goats running across the highway with him. How do I know that's the image of Yishmael ben Avraham Avinu, who founded 12 master tribes all over the Middle East that created a lot of the nations that are now Arab nations. That's true. Geographically, that is true. That the nations of today that, uh, that follow Islam were essentially drawn from these ancient antecedents, which would be Avram Avinu or Yishmael Avinu, or Avinu, wait a minute, we don't call him Ishmael Avinu. I guess some people do. <laughs> that was funny. But anyways, I have nothing, you know, Ishmael has his story. And if you want to learn about it, you can go on YouTube and hear, uh, you know, Arabic professors will, will tell you about Ishmael's story and you'll get a little different idea about what Islam is. But I don't want to go there too much. Nonetheless, how do I know? Well, you don't know because no one was there. So what does the Gemara want from me? That I know that it's Avraham 
son Yishmael, then it's a good sign in a dream. But if it's any Yishmael, then it's a bad sign in a dream. How do I know the difference? Well, you don't know, but I'll tell you how you do know. That this type of information is transmitted immediately from the image to your mind. You won't know what Ishmael ben Avram looks like, but you'll know if it's him. Because the dream will transmit to you its truth or its lack of truth. And if a dream doesn't transmit to you the idea that it's Ishmael, then it means it's not. And if you see an Ish, uh, you know, an Arab in your dream, and it's like radiating this name in your mind, Ishmael, then you can, might be pretty good chance that it is Ishmael. So you see, what this introduces is an idea of dreams that's very important, and we're going to talk about it more in the future, is the, psych, the psychic connection of dreams where there is nonverbal communication, where you receive information without words. You receive information knowing to knowing from one person's mind to another. This is extremely high level, and it's not going to happen overnight, and we have to work for these things. But we need to know they're there to have faith in our tzaddikim, because they got there. Why do we have faith in these people? Because I know he got farther than me. And when I have faith in these people, automatically the system seems to work and my mind connects. Okay? So there is this trans transition of information that takes place psychically where there are no words even. You just know something in the dream that it's true or not. So if you see Ishmael, you'll know it's him. And if you see just any old Mah you know Muhammad or <laughs> Ahmad <laughs> or Fatima, then you'll know that it's not him. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now if you see a, a camel in your dream, what does that mean? Well, mita. It means there was a death sentence put on a person in heaven. Niknasalo mina shamayim v'tziluhu mimena. That really there was a death penalty decreed on a person. But if he saw a camel in his dream, it means it was pushed away. He was saved from it. So who would know that unless you learned Talmud? Unless you learned uh, the, te the ninth parak of Mesech Brachot? No one's going to tell you these things. So go figure why the Jews are so powerly, uh, powerfully attached to learning the Torah. Because you can't get this information elsewhere. Amar Rabbi Hama bar Rabbi Hanina My Rabbi Hama asks, what is this pasuk telling me? God said to Moses, I will go down to Egypt with you. And I will also come up with you from Egypt. Very nice. It only took 210 years for God to fulfill his promise. Seems like a long time. But nonetheless, he did do it. Rav Nachman bar Yitzhak Mehacha. He learns here, Gam Hashem evira tatcha lo tamud. So the idea of seeing the, the camel in a dream, we see it in another pasuk. God, God said, Hashem evir hatatcha. No, Moses said this, excuse me. God will remove your sin and you won't die. So we see that the pasuk is supporting the idea. Aroe Pinchas Pachalomna, someone who sees Pinchas, who of course was the grandson of Arna Kohen. If you see him in a dream, Pele Naselo, a wonder, <coughs> a miracle wonder is going to be done for him. Aroe Peel Bachalom. Now, if you see an, an elephant in a dream, Pilaot Nasulo, then wonders are going to be done for him. Not just one, but many. Now, if you see many, if you see a herd of elephants in a dream, wonders of wonders will be done for him. So that all sounds, wow, that sounds great. I want to see some, some a herd of elephants in my dream. However, the, the basis of this, again, is based on the Hebrew letters, the holy language, that the peel is, of course, 
Pe Yud Lamed, but those root letters also are connected to the word of Pele, a wonder. So again, the rabbis are conceptually transferring meaning from these letters combination to that letter combination. Can we loosen our mind up about words? That I can see words as having different meanings in different contexts? That's what the rabbis have done here. And I think it's a wonderful thing to free up our mind from being locked into our our previously known interpretations of words. Appeal is a pele, a pele is appeal. What's your problem? <laughs> it's not a problem. But if I get rigid, again, this idea, think of it, remember it, if I get rigid in my interpretations, I lose the, the, the flexibility to, to receive that higher knowledge. And that's really why we're here. Okay. How are we doing on time? We have time. You see, we have time. Time doesn't have us. That's a big paradigm shift, by the way. Okay. Rav Nachman Bar Yitzhak Amar Mehachap, right? He brought over the peel, and we're not going to die. Aro e peel b'chalom pilaot, right? Pilim, we said pilaot. Wait a minute, the Gemara is thinking like we normally think. Wait a minute, all kinds of animals are coming through dreams. And the Gemara's, the ha tanya, that hay in the word, in front of the word tanya is called the contradictory hay. And anybody who's trying to learn Gemara, call it kavot, it's one of the hardest types of learnings that you can do. But if you do it, you're going to be like a lawyer for God. Because it's really law school. Learning shas is like learning going to law school, but you're a lawyer for God and not for the <laughs> not for the bar or the, <laughs> the state senate. But nonetheless, if you, this idea, it's a contradiction to what we just learned about the, the the elephants representing miracles and wonders. Okay, nice, but what? We all see many animals that are a nice sign in dreams. We've learned so. What's the, the chidush? Chutz min apil o min akof. Except the, the, the monkey and the elephant. We're not, we're not, it's not good to see them according to this brighter. So the Gemara says, no, it's not a difficulty. Lo kasha. Ha, de misareg, ha, de lo misareg. Misareg here means ukaf or saddled. If you see, that is to say, if you see, a saddle on an on an elephant or a saddle on a monkey. A saddle means a sign of control and power, so that's a good thing. And the los masarag, but if it's not saddled, then it's not such a good thing. Haray huna b'chalom. Now huna is a name in Hebrew. We have Rav Huna in the. He's an Amora, and there's more than actually more than one Rav Huna in the lists of Sadikim. But Rav Huna is a famous guy, a powerful guy, for sure. But the name Huna itself has power in a dream. Nes Nasalo, it's a sign of a miracle. Now why? What's happening here? Again, look for the linguistic connection. Hanina, Hananya, Hanan, these three names. Now Hanina generally means pardon. When a president lets somebody out of jail, he says it's, he's given somebody a pardon to get out of jail. Now, Mordechai, you've had experience. You know about these poor folks. Now, Hananiah, but is different. Hananiah means God graced him. The Yochanan means that Yud K, Yud Vav graced him. So there's all these types of grace, if you will. Uh, regardless, All these names in a dream, Nisen, Nisim, Nasulo, they all are symbolic of miracles. So you see, we have a conceptual connection here we need to remember, that grace and miracles are connected. Now, a lot of Christians understand this intuitively because that's like their religion is based on this idea of grace. In Judaism, you don't hear this talk about grace too much. But really, in Hasidut and in Kabbalah, when you say someone has chen, 
It means he has grace. That things go well for, for him. When he eats, he has grace. When he dances, he has grace. It's a certain blessing of the way you interact with reality. Right? I remember times where I wasn't so graceful. <laughs> you know? I said the wrong thing at the wrong time, the wrong dance step at the wrong time. Whatever it might be. That was a lack of grace. But when things go with you nicely, smoothly, whether it's the dance floor or it's on a debate floor or it's in the Beit Midrash or it's in your boardroom at your company, the grace is a sign of God's presence. And we do not diminish that. We don't have to advertise because we don't like to advertise too much. Holy things, it's dangerous. But we know that grace, Yochanan, Hanania, Hanina, Huna, all these letters are connected are to this idea of a miracle being done. And halavai, haro'e hesped b'chalom. Now, if you see a eulogy, a mourning for a dead person in a dream, hesped. I'm sorry, Tuvia. What's your question? So, about the name Hanina, etc. If we're seeing the name, or we're seeing an individual with the dead name. No. Ah, very good question. Tuvia asks. Is Hanina, Hanania, Yochanan, are these special individuals named this? Like the, there's many Yoch, Rabbi Yochanans, there's maybe Rabbi Haninas, and Rabbi Han, Hananias, there's more than one of all of them. So your question is a good one. It's really, are these specific people or just the name itself? So I'm looking in Rashi. And Rashi, look what he tells us. Nunim. To see many names, nuns, in your name. Hanania. Right? Hanina. The idea of nuns, Rashi says, Nisim Rabim, that many miracles will be done. Well, we know that in Kabbalah, nun is the letter of 50, Gematria 50. The 50 represents the 50 gates of understanding, the 50 gates of tshuva, the 50 days between Pesach and, and Shavuot. So, but here, Rashi's telling us that the nun, a lot of nuns in your name is a sign of miracles. Because 50 is a completion like the Yovel. Remember, numbers are not just numbers. They are conceptual collectors. Concepts collect around numbers. Okay. And the number 50 is this idea of the Yovel, the 50 years of the Jubilee. When, when, and what's the main thing about the Jewish Jubilee is not that, you know, that we give the queen a new crown and a new coat and a new red carpet. No, the Jubilee in Judaism means that slaves are set free, right? That debts are forgiven. Now, which kingship would you rather live in? The Jewish kingship where they actually forgive you your debts and and let slaves go free, or the kingship where the queen gets a new fur coat. Enough said. Now the Rav answers your question, yeah, Tuvia. Yeah, Ru- T- Rashi says, uh, "What are we talking about? You see these names or people in the dream?" Rashi says, that you see the actual name, right. not the person or the face. Because if it said, oh, if you saw Rav Huna in a dream, how would you know Rav Huna from every other sage in the Gemara? There's thousands of them. You couldn't know them all. But the name Huna, the letters Hanina, right? That is a sign, those nuns of blessing of miracle. So you see, the letters themselves have this power, the miracle itself. Nun itself is a letter of power. It's a it's a letter of of kingship. Okay? How does it work? Well, kingship, the idea of kingship is who is the king? He's the one who sits in the palace and everybody comes to him. They bring their information to the king. They bring uh, reports from the government, uh, from the king kingdom, etc., etc. The king is like the, the, the rikuz in Hebrew, the rikuz meaning the, the oh. place of... Of concent- where everything comes in the concentration, like <laughs> um, focus. the focus point of the whole kingdom is by where the king receives this information. So why is that related to miracle? Because the king is the one, the power to change reality by his choices. Mm-hmm. You know, the Balfour document in 1919, was it? This little one-page letter 
It looks like a letter a guy threw off and his secretary signed it and sent it out in the mail. It doesn't look like an international document of power that the British government is assigning Eretz Israel to the Jewish people. It looks like a letter in the name of some minister over there, Mr. Balfour, who said the Queen said that the Jews should have a land. And they took that one line and built it into British acceptance of a Jewish state. Well, we see how far their acceptance went when they started turning boats back in the middle of the water in the middle of the Shoah. And they'll answer for that. Okay? But the point is that the king has the power of choice over millions of people. And so when he makes a choice, if he makes a choice that you didn't want to ha that you want to happen, that's kind of like a miracle. In other words, whole, all of nature turned your way. Now that's one idea about the nun. There's a lot of ideas about the nun. And Tikkuni Zohar talks about the nun. If you take a letter nun, if you can see my hand here, I don't know if that looks like a nun, maybe, maybe this way. Depends on if you're dyslexic right or left. <laughs> but what happens? You've got a nun here, right? That's like a nun. Now you bend the, he the, head, the body of the nun over like that. Then you put a little point on top like that. What do you have? A tzaddik. So the Tukuni Zohar teaches you the nun is the kingship that you bend over for Hashem. That every Jew thinks he's a king. And you know what? He is. But he's got to bend his head over for the other king, the greater king of kings, and then he gets that yud on top, and when you bend over a yud, like a nun, and you put a, a yud on top like that, what do you got? What do you have? A tzaddik. And so the idea of the tzaddik is the one who bends over his own kingship for God's kingship. And that's that's the work here, folks, because part of us has this spark that we're king. Ani em loch, Rabbi Nachman says. I'm going to rule. I'm going to get what I want. But this is a juvenile position. And we understand that if I can bend this nun of kingship over and add a yud to the top of it, it turns the nun into a tzaddik. You become a righteous person, a holy person, a person who becomes a conduit of the real king. And that's really the goal. Okay, let's see where we're holding in our dream uh, tabloid. It doesn't end, believe me. <laughs> it's great. All right, the hesped we learned. That the hesped in a dream, if you learn, you see a, a eulogy, a, a mourning for a dead person, mina shamayim, the interpretation is that from heaven, hasu alav, mercy was shown to this person, ufaduhu, and he was redeemed. So that's also a very good thing. You might think it's terrible. I saw a burial, a graveyard, people talking about the dead in my dream. No, it's a very good thing because it means that you're going to be redeemed. And this, the Rav tells us, is when you see the words themselves. So that is a very tight distinction between seeing the image of a scene, a scene in your dream, or seeing the actual letters of the words. The word has been. The word has been itself. Okay, well, that's 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 kind of tightens it down to you. That's good. That you mean that just the word, but who sees words in their dreams? Come on, I mean, let's let's. I, I mean, usually you see images. Very very rarely do you see dreams. And we learned a few days last week that if you see words in your dreams or you hear words when you wake up, that pasuk is called a nevuah katana, a small nevuah. It means it's for you. Here and now, in your life, what you need to know about what's going to happen next. That's all. God's trying to help. So we got to try to listen. And it's an amazing process because it, re re it re empowers the idea that Hashem is with us and Hashem is sending us information so that we know the right thing to do. He sent us on a mission to fix this world. He's not going to leave us alone in the middle of the sea when we're out on his mission fixing his world, right? That's the Jewish people got to accept that mission. To be chosen, Reb Shlomo said, to be chosen as the Jewish people means you're chosen to tell the other people they're chosen. <laughs> what a great touch. Only Reb Shlomo could tell us that, right? The Jew thinks, oh, I'm chosen. Oh, yo, yo, I got to do thousands more mitzvot than anybody else, than all the Christians and the Arabs and the, and the Hindus combined. But no, it's not. doesn't mean that. It means that, your 
channel is so rarefied, it's so purified, that we have to keep mitzvot in order to keep our channel alive, in order that the nations receive their nevuah, their their blessing, and their relationship to God is coming through this idea of one God. So to be chosen means you're chosen to tell others they're chosen. They're chosen because if you're a human being, you're already chosen. It means that a spark is inside you that we have to deal with. And if I run from it, it's going to hurt. Okay, so we got to stop running and start laughing and dancing and celebrating this spark. Okay, let's move on to a little halakha for uh, Purim coming up in a few days. And uh, here in Israel, it's quite a deal because it's like three-day long festival between the 14th, the Purim of Perazim, and the 15th, the Shushan Purim, the capital city Purim, and then Shabbat follows right after. Okay, so the Benish Hai, we've been learning a little bit of his halacha about these ideas. The Benish Hai, we learned already, right, that we have certain a mitzvah of hearing the Megillah, but we have to hear it from somebody who has to hear it himself, and not a child, and not a person who's lost his mind a little bit, and not a person who can't hear. And we learned also that if the, if the reader falls asleep, it's a problem for those who are listening, but if the listener falls asleep, you just wake up, slap yourself on the cheek, and, and keep going, right? Now also, we have blessings that we make. And when we make the blessings over the Megillah, we make them standing up. We learned about this before, that standing up in front of the Kahal, when you make a blessing, is is, is a sign of honor and 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 respect. And that's, you know, ain't kavod el Torah. When people stand up in court for the judge, they don't stand up because they honor the judge. They stand up because they're afraid of the bailiff. They're afraid of the policeman. They're afraid of the district attorney. They're afraid of getting a potch on the head if you'll stand up for the judge. But when Judaism, when a rabbi enters and you stand up, it's because you honor what he honors. We honor the Torah. Ein kavod el Torah. So it's, it's important to make those distinctions. I'm not putting down judges or their office or their job. It's a job I don't want. If anybody wants to be a judge, they better be really, really honest, pure, and sincere. Because it's a place that the rabbis say, a box of snakes sits in front of you. Right, a, a kufat, kupat a sheratzim, snakes and evil things, nasty animals, because all that are, are the, ju- the judgments that a person brings on himself when he judges. So the first thing we want to do in spiritual service is stop judging others. Right, it's just really a dangerous thing. Okay. So before we have these blessings, we make them standing up. It's all in your siddur or in most Megillot. You have this, the blessings before and after. There's the blessing of Shechianu, right? That we've come to this time of the year. And if you forget it, you could stop and make the blessing at that point. Okay. All right. Now let's say a person uh, is reading the, Kri- the Megillah alone in his house. He lives in, you know, Antarctica and he has a little igloo and it's a little chilly over there. But he, he's reading the Megillah because he believes in God and he's, he's alone in the world in Antarctica. What does he do? Kriyata eno tzarik ma'umad. He doesn't have to stand up if he's the only guy there. Okay? You see? V'rak ha-shliach tzibur kora'a ma'umad mepnei kavod ha-tzibur. Right? The shliach tzibur reading because of the honor for the kahal, for the community. Now, this is an interesting detail of the halakha. V'tzarik liot poshet ota kula. We need to open up the Megillah. It comes in a scroll because that's the way all ancient documents were were written and delivered. We open up the scroll completely. And then we make the, st- the blessing standing up. Now the Rav asks, He makes the blessing when he's standing. Afterwards, But he still needs something that he's putting the Megillah on. A, a, a bima, which is kind of like a mini Ark or stand and or a chair even. But the ikar is that the megillah should not be allowed to to roll around on the floor, right? The floor is considered a lowly place in Kabbalah. Now, these are interesting things. You know, you think about it, Tuvia. You have a floor. That's where your feet go. 
You have a table. That's where your hands go. You have your pillow. That's where your head goes. Let me ask you a question. In every house, every house in the world, there's a rag we use to wipe the floor. Are you going to wipe your face with that floor? No way. Right? Now, there is a, a rag in every house that you wipe your hands after you do the dishes. Are you going to wipe your face with that dish rag? No way. So you see, the rag itself is a representation of the level of what I'm dealing with. And my face, my face is the panim that God gave me. It's a place where it emits light and, and love and, and joy and, and truth and suffering. I'm not going to put a, a floor rag on my face. And even a table rag I'm not going to put on my face. So I'm not going to put my Megillah on the floor either. Understand why it's so important? That we, do we understand the distinctions of the spiritual realm are reflected here in the physical realm. The floor is the level of our feet. That's the lowest level. The, the level of a table is our hands. That's the middle level. The level of your head, that's the highest level. And so things that you use on your face and your head, you're not going to use elsewhere. And that's a sign of the kedusha that's internalized inside us. And you don't have to be religious, you don't have to be Jewish to know these things because they're self-evident in our own living of life. So this is like every, this is the real thing. This is the real Kabbalah. That you want to know why, like we say in, in Judaism, you shouldn't wear the shoes of a, a person who died in his shoes. Like, you know, that doesn't sound so hard to understand. You know, here in Israel, we have these wonderful uh Gamachs, they're called, Gemilut Hasadim. They're clothing stores that sell things at a very cheap price. A dollar, two dollars for a pair of shoes, a shirt, etc. Very cheap prices. But you know where these clothes are coming from. They're not coming from the store. Most of the time, they're coming from people who passed away. Okay. So how do I bear up, buy a pair of used shoes if I know that the guy, some guy who died, wore them? Okay, so listen closely. This is amazing. If the, the Torah says, if the person dies in those shoes, that means that the angel of death touched those shoes because he was wearing them when the angel of death took his soul out of his body. That's called Tuma. But if a person dies barefoot and his brand new Nikes are in the closet, those shoes are not connected to his death in the way that we're talking about. That connection of physical proximity to the removal of the soul from the body. So a pair of Nike shoes in the closet that someone donates to the Gemach, and you can buy them for 10 shekels, <laughs> that's okay. They're not Tameh. But the pair of shoes that someone died in, those are, you better avoid those, you know. And it's it's not a funny thing. I mean, it is, we can laugh, but, you know, how many World War II stories have we heard about, you know, soldiers walking in rags in the snow, and their feet are bleeding, and they would do anything for a pair of boots. Okay, that's another situation. But we need to understand and be sensitive to these issues because they're part of who we are. And the rabbis are not giving us laws because because they're bored, but because they want us to have the truth. And they care about us. And that's important. Okay. So those are a couple of halachot for the Megillah. We don't let it drag on the floor. We open it up first and fold it up. We say the blessing standing up. But if you're alone in, a, in an igloo in, in Alaska, then, you know, okay, it's not as strict. <laughs> you're standing up for the polar bear and the walrus and the seal. It's okay. They're good things in dreams, too. All right. Let's keep going. We're going to change uh, gears here to learn a little chasidut from Rabbi Nachman. And we still are in Torah Hay of Tenyana. And this Torah continues to amaze me every time I learn it. Because... This is the nature of Torah. Every time you read true Torah, it, it seems like the first time. That's a miracle unto itself. Okay, so we're in Torah Hei Tenyana. And we're holding in this very long paragraph, which is paragraph Yud, and the paragraph begins, Nisan. We learned this already. That the angel, the good angel that 
gives us holy dreams is strengthened in the month of Nisan. The Rebbe proves it out through the idea of the idea of the minui, the appointment of jobs to angels and human beings happens at this time. Because, and because of course, the first appointment of all appointments is the appointment of the king, and that takes place on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. So this, there's this power of appointment. Right? If you're a head of a corporation, and you're trying to decide who's going to take over after you, Rosh Chodesh Nisan's a good time. Or if you're a head coach of a football team, and you want to turn over the coach the <laughs> job to the assistant, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And so on and so forth. The idea is that these powers are coming into the world at these times. The Jewish calendar is an extremely precise wheel of power. And each time the wheel turns, it reveals a new type of power. And that's called, in this case, Rosh Chodesh Nisan. And it says, Be'u Nisan, because az huzman tikkun chizuk shalehem, of the angel. Right? That's the time of the appointment of the angel, the strengthening of that angel. Now, this is the important principle we need to always remember, that every day of the year, we can renew our will with joy. The joy is the great secret of life, because joy renews will. And when you have will, you have power. And power means you can do things. And do things means you can accomplish something. And when you accomplish something, you feel much closer to Hashem. Because you're trying to accomplish what He wants. Again, the idea that through having joy, we give strength to the positive angels. And then, by us being in Simcha, we arouse Simcha in those angels as if their will is renewed. So can you imagine? <laughs> this is a nice idea. An angel visits you, Tuvia, but he says, I'm tired. I can't make it. I'm an old angel. What am I going to do? And Tuvi says, well, Rabbi Nachman told me, I just need to be happy and that will give you joy. That will give you strength and ratzon. That's exactly what he's saying. Nitchadesh a ratzon. That the will is renewed, that the, even an angel can have his r- r- will renewed. Ay, ay, ay. Okava mitzvah, mitzbaya, aved b'chayo shamaya. And according to your choice, was the power was done in heaven. But on the same day, it's as if every day is the day of appointment when you get new will. When you have new will to get up out of bed and go to work and do the good things that you need to do for your family and for your community and for the world, that's called new. That's called the renewal of will. When I don't want to get out of bed and I don't want to do anything that I that I normally do that keeps me aligned then it means my will is weak. And joy is the key. About Ikar, Yitchat Ratzon, he says, but Nisan, but the essential time of the year for this renewal of the joy is Nisan, the month that's coming to us very soon. Because in Nisan is the time of the redemption. It's the time of the freeing of the slaves. And of course, all of us have our enslavements. Okay, everybody has a little bit of that part of us that's, wait, wait, he's, he's under the, the taskmaster. The taskmaster, of course, is our, what we call the Yetzirah. I like, I started calling him the other guy, right? The Kabbalah calls him the, the other side, but he's the other guy. Rabbi Nachman, he's, he's, he's got the understanding. He says he's the Dimayon itself. The power of imagination is a, is a lens. And he says that lens can do anything with reality that it wants. It can twist and turn your reality. And that's why uh, he says the Koch HaDimayon is a new name for the Yetzer. In itself. Right? In, itself? In itself. That the lens is, oh. is, it's a lens in your mind. You receive from the lens and you project from it. It's part of the layers of your mind. 
Why is so we call that evil? Well, it's a question, right? I mean, what do you mean? I mean, dimyon can be used for good. Like so imagination good. can be used for good. That's right, Tuvia, and it can also be used for not good. So it's this static, neutral plane where images enter and leave, where ideas enter and leave, where speech enters and leaves. It's that isplakaria that lends she'ena mi'ira, that does not illuminate from itself, but it's receiving from behind it. It's cloudy. It's got images. It's not so clear. This was what Rabbi Nachman calls the, the evil inclination because it has the ability to take your truth and twist it. And, and God could tell you, Avraham, go to that mountain and plant that tree, and you'll be like, what? I don't want to, it's too cold outside. I don't want to go plant some tree in a mountain. That means I'm arguing with God. Now, how, then I'll say, well, how do I know it's God? Maybe it's not God. So my mind starts turning things around and raising questions that aren't questions, and suddenly your desire is diminished. And the Rebbe says, the closer you get to Kedusha, the more of those kind of thoughts you get. So when you get those negative thoughts, just dismiss them because they're, it's like children screaming at you while you're running, you know, to do this something very important. The children don't understand why you're running to go to catch the bank before they close the door. <laughs> but you don't listen to them. And we don't listen to those voices. Yeah, Tuvia. No, so the question I've seen elsewhere is that Korach HaDimion is, is so essential to understanding concepts in Torah. Right. So why is that called the Yisrael Very good so point. I'm confused. Tuvia is asking, so the power of imagination is that saint, is also the power in the mind to compare things. Lidamot Davar le davar, to compare one thing to another. If I look at the, the, the wrinkles in my hand, I see the patterns of the maps of the rivers of Israel. If, when I look at a map, they look the same. They branch out the same. This river goes that way. This river goes that way. So do the, the lines in my hand. That's le damot, to compare one thing to another. That's also the power of the imagination. Why is that evil? But why is that equal? Evil. Why is it evil? Very good question. It's not evil. Unto itself, it's not evil. What makes it evil is how I use the information. Ah, that's Rabbi Nachman's intention, you're saying. Right. Ah, that we have to understand that if my imagination is impure, mm. then I will receive impure information from what I see and hear. Mm. And if my imagination is pure, then I will receive things as they are. Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the whole idea of being able to distinguish good and evil, truth and falsehood on our own, in our own consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that is what enables the mind to see the truth in a dream or not. Mm -hmm. If I'm not pure, I can't tell you your dream because I'm already, I'm already filling the gaps of my imagination with my own stuff and not seeing who you are. So th this idea of purity is like this infinite thing because it, the mind gets can get purer and purer, or less and less. But the the chochamidame, the power of imagination, is this amazing gift to compare things. But if my my tools, you know, <laughs> if you have a rusty screwdriver, how good is it going to do the job? You know, if I'm a, a you know an architect and my and my ruler is bent, how good is that going to help me? Right, so we need to have a straight ruler to be able to get a straight interpretation of reality. Okay, Vaaz ben Nisan, Hayav Ra'uy Lejitpatel Therefore, in Nisan is a time that's fitting to cancel out all the impurity. We're leaving Egypt. We're going through the mikvah of the Red Sea. We're going through the Ten Miracles over a year-long time. It's a time to leave Egypt in Egypt. Okay. Legamre, the Rebbe says, because we have strengthened this angel with joy. That can you imagine you're leaving Egypt with three million Jews and Moses is saying, okay, we're going that way, guys, across the desert. Don't ask any questions. You're like, am I going to be happy or worried? Ooh, what's Moses doing? He's taking us out in the desert. No more, <laughs> you know, no more watermelons. <laughs> But really, that's the whole point, is that I trust Moses' lens more than mine, because his lens is pure, because God spoke to him clearly, and he heard it, and he told me, and it happened. So faith in the prophet is not just blind faith. 
It's based on a knowledge of way the system works. Okay, and I'll, I'll repeat this 10,000 more times if I have to. It depends on our understanding of how the system works. Then our amuna grows because we see, wow, you know, it's true. My mind is a filter. It's a lens. I receive things. I interpret them. I act on them. But the purer my mind, the purer my interpretation and the purer my reaction. So we're coming to the end of our little time together today from the Chabura. And God willing, tomorrow the, the hail and the rain and the wind will slow down a little bit and we'll get to Jerusalem, to the Holy Yeshiva, the Mekubalim, which has really been the anchor of my life. And I invite all of you, when you come to Jerusalem, just come for 15 minutes, sit in the air and the atmosphere the space of the people who are dedicated to these ideas, who are living these ideas. And if you don't come to Jerusalem, well, keep coming here, and we'll try to do the best we can to translate a little bit. And uh, may all of you be blessed. This is a holy week. We're getting ready for Purim. It's a new redemption. It's a freedom from a malek. It's a freedom from doubt. Now, if you have freedom from doubt, you're going to be a very happy person. And I bless all of us with that joy, the confidence in God. God confidence is where we're going. All the best.